Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Jameson Lop. James, Jameson, thanks so much for coming on my show. Um, my I, how are you doing? <laughs> I think I saw you in Riga uh, and in Berlin on both occasions. That is that correct. Me? Yeah, wonderful. Okay. Otherwise, unfortunately, we didn't have you know, uh, any opportunity or time. Uh, I would have loved to do this like in, in, in person. But maybe we can catch it up, uh, catch up my, um, later on or uh, next event. So, Jameson, I have a bunch of questions, of course, for myself. But since I've, um, you know, gone through your uh, treasure trove of um, of materials, um, it's uh, uh, and I've listened to uh, some of your interviews, which you have uh, posted on your own uh, website, lop.net. Then you have this other website, it's called satoshi.info. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit later on that. Sure, sure. And, yeah, and the other one, yeah, that's the same thing, lob.net. So I can suggest anyone of my listeners and viewers just check it out. It's, it's really a treasure trove of interviews, material resources, educational materials. This is what my uh, podcast show, Bitcoin Only, is about, uh, uh, inspiring. Uh, now I must say, uh, Jameson, I'm not an I'm not a technologist. I'm not technical. I I can't you know deal anything with technical jargon. So um, uh, I'm trying really with this uh, the, the the name of the, my podcast is the Total Connector, and the name itself uh, implies you know that I'm, I'm I'm really attempting my best to connect the dots or inspire people uh, for themselves to you know to to educate themselves, to empower themselves with, you know, with the, with really multifaceted knowledge that Bitcoin uh, brings uh, with itself. Now, um, you can talk about anything you want. You have a, at least a full hour if you want. <laughs> but uh, I do have some specific questions um, regarding, uh, especially the CASA full node, um, uh, security, privacy. Uh, the adoption rate or the adoption possibilities. Uh, I also have a little bit of, of questions about the treasure, the advanced and non-advanced mode. So, how do you want to? How do you want to like do this? Uh, do you want me like to go question after question, or should we like more? Uh, you know, zoom out a little bit, and uh, maybe I think I think it's a good idea. I want to ask you, what is Bitcoin for you? What's the essence, uh, the the purpose, the intention, the wish behind Bitcoin? And do you think we could be much further if there weren't specific obstacles or challenges, uh, you know, for mass adoption? Yeah, it makes sense to begin at the beginning. Uh, what is Bitcoin? And, you know, that is something that people have been arguing about ever since the project began. Um, to me, I mean, this is all a grand experiment uh, to try to create a new form of money that is an open collaborative project. I mean, that is the fundamental reason why I got interested and involved years ago was because I had never really thought about money or how it worked. But once I read the white paper and I started thinking about money uh, at a more specific level rather than just uh, using whatever was given to me, I thought, you know, hey, it, it makes sense that this is an abstract concept that kind of belongs to humanity. So why shouldn't it be a project where anyone who cares can give their input and try to you know reshape the way that money actually operates now of course this creates a lot of complexities because you're 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 going from a system that is essentially controlled by a small number of people who can probably easily come to a consensus about what money should be to basically a free for all uh where you know there is no traditional hierarchical governance system um this this anarchy as it were uh, is a lot more difficult to understand and people are you know trying to apply different forms of governance to it and and so far all of those attempts have failed so th this is a continuing experiment because no one really fully understands what it is uh that we have built here like people are still poking at the system and trying to understand how it responds to different things and how we can evolve it over time and of course this is why we have conferences all over the world uh, to try to get uh, people to come together to discuss you know what are our options 
uh, and amongst those potential options, which ones do we think are the safest and the sanest and uh, are possible to, to actually implement uh, while causing the least amount of harm and disruption to the existing users. So this is, this is something where you can basically go as deep as you want. And I've gone really, really deep over the years and have still only really scratched the surface. And I think that as you, you showed with some of the resource pages that I maintain, I think, I think I have over seven or 800 linked resources on there. And that, that actually becomes a pretty decent part-time job in and of itself, just trying to maintain this comprehensive list of resources and, and at least organize it in a way so that it's not too overwhelming for people because you could easily get lost in there and, uh, and never find your way out of the rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, so, James, that's that's fascinating. At, wh wh why don't you tell tell me or tell tell my listeners wh what was what was your path to Bitcoin? I mean, um, what's the fundamental uh, you know root cause uh, of 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 our monetary you know and economical, financial, social problems? Is is uh, do, do we have to remind as Eric Vaskul always says? And you know, you've you've been you know a lot of conversations and, and discussion panel discussion also with him on different conferences I've uh, I've seen and, and 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 you know I've experienced myself so it's real fascinating do we need to remind people I mean do you think people really understand what the problem is uh, in regards to separation of state government nation state whatever and money do you think people understand the seriousness of of the situation we are in right now well, no. I mean, most people don't have the time to worry about these things. You know, most people are just worried about where their next paycheck is going to come from, you know, uh, on the sort of, uh, what is it, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, uh, I think a lot of people have, you know, their, their food pretty well taken care of in most countries, uh, but, you know, are still trying to get to that next level where their, their shelter and their other bills uh, are, are something that they actually have to worry about uh, because they don't have you know, sufficient uh, financial reserves uh, and they have to keep replenishing them and they have to keep uh, earning money and, and you know, being able to, to take care of themselves and pay off their debts and all these other things. And so uh, you pretty much have to get like all of your needs taken care of to get to the point where you have enough free time where you can start worrying about things like politics or economics or, you know, these, these greater, higher level issues with uh, civilization. So I don't expect that we'll ever get to the point where most or even many people worry about this type of stuff. But I also don't think it's necessary that everyone has to understand it, everyone has to worry about it. Uh, there are a number of, of different studies that have shown that, you know, in order to enact meaningful change, you only really need a small, like, single-digit percentage of the populace to become very, very... Uh, interested in in getting change to happen and so I, I think that uh, while we should try to educate as many people as possible it's fine if the vast majority of people don't have the the time or resources to worry about this stuff yeah you said a couple of very uh, very very essential important things uh, first of all yeah I, I do agree with you it's people don't have the time they don't have to, um, uh, but it is, the situation is a little bit schizophrenic because I'm in Austria, you know, whatever, Europe, Western, you know, developed country, whatever. And and then you got the other countries like Venezuela, Turkey, Argentina, Iran, high inflation, hyperinflation, sanctions, embargoes, real suffering. The pain point has been reached. They feel it and they go into action. You don't need to do much explaining, even though, you know, most of them probably still don't know what, you know, how Bitcoin really works, how, you know, do I? I don't. I mean, I've been in this rabbit hole for three years and I'm still learning and re learning and you're going into deeper and deeper rabbit holes. But there is something in between. I mean, either people, I think people over here in Western developed countries, Western uh, uh, states, they are much more, they are, you know, they feel comfortable. I mean, that's, that's the argument they give me like spontaneously. Anybody, you know, who you ask, uh, it's like, what do you need Bitcoin for? You know, I can, you know, pay my proverbial coffee with this and that. And then on the other extreme, you've got people who, who feel the social, economical, real existential threat. And so 
I'm trying here to find, I think this is what we're, why we're doing this also, or why that's the intention of my podcast also. And, and so, so many other educational materials. There's so many, you know, wonderful podcasters beginning with Steve Levera and Peter McCormack and, you know, all these people out there. I think they all have understood, comprehended the ethos, the logic, the, the, the only choice option we have with Bitcoin. And to be honest with you, I mean, very frank, I think we're going to be fucked as hell if we cannot, uh, you know, uh, implement or mass adopt Bitcoin as as soon as possible. And you talked about the thing, this critical mass or something like that, like a, a marginal uh, number of people that 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 triggers this this maybe this ch chain reaction. Just you know, uh, uh, paraphrasing here, but. Do you see like there's? Do you think we there is an op, there's a way there's an opportunity here? There's uh, is there ways to improve the educational process, the technological process, the implementation? Do you think there could be more communication cooperation? Yeah, so it, it's really weird. Um, you know, you you noted a number of really good educators in the space, and I think one of the problems is there's a big disconnect and it's almost kind of ironic that it seems like the vast majority of the education and discussion and, and resources are all in English. Um, I know there are some people who work on translating things into other languages, but it's, it's almost kind of ironic that I think the people who could benefit the most from this technology, uh, do not have the same level of educational resources available to them. I think there's also some really big disconnects between um, the East and the West, uh, you know, mainly due to language and cultural barriers. It's very hard uh, for me and probably a lot of other people to understand, you know, what is going on in, in China and Russia, for example, with their Bitcoin uh, communities. And so they may have a very different understanding and perspective of what Bitcoin is. And, you know, that can potentially cause a lot of issues in the future. But um, the, the other thing, though, is that I don't believe that the technology is currently available to scale in the way that we want it to. Uh, so I'm kind of okay with the fact that not everyone is using Bitcoin right now because it would actually not work very well if we got everyone uh, onto Bitcoin unless unless they were using Bitcoin through third-party custodians, uh, which, you know, is not the way that we want them to, to use it. Um, and that is a, a debate in and of itself. There are some people who believe that even if Bitcoin never scaled the way we want it to, that even if most people were using Bitcoin banks or exchanges, that it would still be an improvement on the current system because you would still be able to do things like audit the total supply and, you know, prevent runaway inflation and whatnot. Uh, but of course, you know, we want to try to make this system the best that possibly can be in every possible way. And uh, it's a very big challenge to do that. And it's going to take a lot of time and, and effort to continue to make these incremental improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, after this um, Lightning Conference in Berlin, um, what's, your, what's your position now? What's your take? Uh, what is your view on the on the degree of, of improvement, of implementation, of uh, how far are we, you know, or, or in, from your perspective, what are the problems, the challenges when it comes to lightning, this, this second layer? I mean, at the, at the end of the day, you know, it's about, it's, it's so un unbelievable. Sometimes I'm like, it's 2019, it's the year 2019, and we still haven't figured out how people can transact freely. I mean, this is at, what it all boils down to, right? I mean, freely without censorship uh, and, 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 and with the hardest and scarcest money. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're getting there, but where do you see the problem challenges? How can we improve it? Yeah, I mean, digital scarcity is hard. Building secure systems on the internet is hard. Um, that That is, that's really the trade-off, you know, when you're moving outside of this like closed ecosystem or walled garden where, you know, one, one entity controls it and they can put up, you know, really intensive security measures because they control everything versus going to a completely open system kind of turns everything on its head, uh, requires a lot more work on the security side. But, um, you know, the thing with Lightning is that we're actually we're creating this new economic network where 
it's never really existed before. Um, you know, re requiring uh, liquidity to actually exist in a like provably, you know, cryptographic sense rather than just being able to make up numbers and push them over the internet between, you know, central banks or whatever. Uh, so there, there are many issues both on the sort of economic uh, and liquidity side uh, also on the security side, because, you know, now we're, we're going back to more of a hot wallet model than a cold wallet. And, um, also really the presentation that I gave in, uh, at the lightning conference in Berlin was all about what's really required to get enterprises onto the lightning network. And that's going to be very important from a liquidity side, but the enterprises have much higher, um, standards for robustness and uh, risk. So we need a lot of improvements on the technical side for their like day-to-day -day operations. So, you know, this is, once again, it's going to be years of effort uh, and, and, you know, what we're doing at CASA and what a lot of other companies are doing with Lightning is they are, they are running, you know, these risky services and they are encountering failures and they're learning from the failures and they're continuing to iterate and improve upon it. And, um, you know, it's very difficult to extrapolate to say, oh, we, we just need to have, you know, this many more years of failures before like, you know, enterprises will be uh, uh, in an acceptable position to adopt it. Um, it's going to be a gradual thing. Um, that's why there is, you know, the whole like lightning network is going to be ready in 18 months meme is kind of a, a running joke is that, uh, you know, software is never done. Uh, there's never going to be a point at which we say, okay, you know, we don't have to do anything more for lightning network. Like there's always yeah. going to be more room for improvement. But better, but better than two weeks because Max Hillebrand always yeah. has two weeks, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. Two, I think 18 months is a better expectation because it's far enough away that people will forget about whatever promises you made. <laughs> 18 months ago. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it could go into a lot of t deep technical weeds about the potential improvements. Um, but you know, there's even more potential improvements at the, the base layer that could uh, result in orders of magnitude of improvement at mm -hmm. the, the second layer with lightning network. So there is a huge, uh, amount of potential things that could happen over the coming years and you know hopefully they will all happen and um, you can get very hand wavy about talking about things like uh, uh, basically like shared lightning channels between hundreds or thousands of people and you know ways to continue to get orders of magnitude improvement um, but as it, as it stands right now uh, that's still all on the like to-do list uh, so you know I don't think that we're going to be at, you know, mainstream adoption levels anytime, even in the next few years. All right. You talk about uh, institutions like enterprises. Uh, now I know it's all about, you know, trial and error and it's like life, you know, it, we've got to learn and comprehend, uh, you know, consciously out of these mistakes and, and errors. But do you think, do you think institutions are, are, could bring like a, a positive trajectory into this development? Like in terms of, you, you, you mentioned liquidity, um, yeah, custodial, it, I think it's inevitable. There will be people who will need custodial, right? Uh, there's no other way to, to do this other than custodial. So there's going to be a, a majority, uh, or I don't know, a number of people. Um, how do you think institutions could contribute to this process positively or in, in terms of speed? Or Well, I mean... Uh... I suspect that most of them are just going to be, you know, building uh, their own systems or integrating, uh, you know, the lightning technology into their existing systems. Um, it would be great if, if some of them came in and started contributing at the protocol layer. But, I mean, we already saw, you know, on, on the, the Bitcoin protocol side, even as many different uh, large companies came forward and, and were even making billions of dollars a year, very few, if any of them, ended up contributing much back uh, to the protocol itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not something that I would uh, hold out too much hope for. Mm. Uh, if anything, you know, the institution stuff is, I think, more later phase of, you know, once the technology is more mature, then they will adopt it. And, uh, you know, that will onboard more people.
Mm. So it's going to take years. That's for sure. Yeah. All mm -hmm. right. Well, that's a realistic assessment. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, then um, let me let me ask you a couple of specific questions, and then I'll we'll come back. Maybe we'll zoom out again. Um, the Casa Full Note. I finally ordered it. <laughs> um, I'm waiting. We're waiting for all for the uh, version two. Yeah. Now. Um, if I if I may say that, I mean I uh, you know the average person like myself, let, let's say you know can afford that, no problem. You know it's three hundred dollars, and then you've got additional three hundred dollars subscription free per year. Do you think it is feasible to, to uh, you know for this normal package, it's called the golden uh, version, to lower the price in or and then you know maybe through competition or I don't know or through further development, uh, make this a little bit more affordable for people? For the lower class, you know, like low, below. Oh uh, well, I mean, a lot of that comes down to you know what is what is the cheapest hardware that is available. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to get you know small form factor, you know, Raspberry Pi uh, type hardware, um, which. All in all, I think you know Raspberry Pi boards usually go for like fifty to a hundred dollars, uh, but then you need uh, like some uh, decent storage, which is probably going to be another hundred dollars. Um, and and then of course there is the actual cost of all the software that we write and the support that we give. Um, I think we also throw in a, a hardware uh, wallet device as well. Um, so uh, I think. If we're talking about ways to get new hardware shipped to people uh, to run as nodes, you're you're going to be hard pressed to ever get that below the probably hundred to hundred fifty dollar price point, and that is assuming hardware only. That is if if the user is then going to go get some software and install it and basically set up everything themselves. It's definitely possible to get your own new hardware node running up for that uh, level of cost. The only way to get what I would say is a really cheap, affordable node is to you reuse old hardware that you already have laying around. You know, maybe you have a like five-year-old or ten-year-old laptop or desktop that's just sitting in a closet. Uh, you know, that would be essentially free to get up and running. And uh, the nice thing about all of the the Bitcoin and Lightning software is that it's not that computationally intensive. You can run it on really old hardware. It'll be a little bit slower, but it'll still do what it's meant to, to do. So from that perspective, if we're talking about like how, how would we get uh, you know, people in third world countries running nodes and all of that, I think it would, it would probably be more along those lines of repurposing old hardware uh, because you can get the software for free. But once again, that still does require uh, at least small amount of uh, technical ability uh, and uh, time and resources to to set that up. So you know what we're aiming for with Casa, it it is not going to be the cheapest solution. Uh, you know we're we're not trying to onboard absolutely everybody uh, right now. Our target audience is you know the enthusiast who has some extra money that they'd be willing to spend, but they don't have the technical savvy or they just don't have the time to get in there and you know uh, run the software and maintain it. And uh, we're, we're trying to lower the bar on the technical side for people to be able to take advantage of running a full node and self-custodying their own keys. And uh, you know there are plenty of costs involved to all the development that we have to do to make things easier yeah. for people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it just uh, the, the subscription free, which I think um, could be, you know, done away with. I mean, the, the subscription free is for like losing a key, so you, you know, so people have that service, two out of three or three out of five keys, right? Multi signature, you know, is that is that the service uh, uh, subscription? Right. Free? So you know, the the thing about Casa is we're not just selling a node we have an entire suite of products and they're they're meant to to work together to get you the best uh, like self sovereignty solution available and so the the subscription is really for support uh, and continued like access to the multi sig setup and and uh, and recovery uh, from certain failure scenarios if something goes wrong there um, and and also, you know, if we were if we were just 
selling nodes uh, standalone, then it, it gets kind of weird from a support perspective of uh, what happens now that there's going to be like a secondary market with, you know, V1 nodes floating around, uh, you know, how much support do we want to, to give to people who, you know, we don't know how they actually got their node because they didn't buy it from us. Yeah. So, uh, but, but still updates uh, would be anytime possible, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned in your, one of your interviews that I listened to uh, was called Bitcoin Custody and Key Management for, uh, on the Blockchain VC podcast. Uh, you said it's, it's actually with the Casa node, you know, comes that uh, this, this Trezor hardware wallet. So it is not actually because of that service, it is actually not advised to write down that seed phrase or the monomic phrase. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Or do you think it st could still be useful sort of as a last joker? It, you know, I'm just, you know, thinking worst case scenario, what if something goes totally bust and, you know, the company or uh, you still have, would st still have that seed? Ah, so uh, to be clear, the 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 trezor that we are sending is meant to be used in the Casa uh, multi-sig wallet. So, okay. gotcha. uh, the basic multi-sig is two out of three. We also have a three out of five key shield that's a sort of more premium tier. And uh, if you want to understand more about our seedless model, the best thing to do is actually go on our website and look at our wealth security protocol, which is, it's like 50 or 60 pages of in-depth uh, explanation of every possible uh, attack and loss vector that we've thought through when we were designing our multi-sig uh, wallets and, uh, and basically how we mitigate against those things. And we do specifically talk about the seed issue and that this is, as far as I'm aware, we are the only uh, wallet out there that actually has this seedless setup where uh, the thesis that we built this all upon is that asking the user to do anything technical or to have any like special security knowledge is a big a foot gun, if you will. Uh, it's, uh, it creates a lot of possibilities for failure and we should not assume that the user has any particular knowledge or expertise. And the problem that we kept running into when we were thinking about, well, you know, what do you actually do when you set up a multi-sig wallet with hardware devices? Well, when you, you go plug in your hardware device for the first time, it says, okay, these are your 12 or 24 words, write them down, keep them in a safe place. And if you think about it, that sentence has an entire iceberg of like technical and security knowledge underneath it that it just completely glosses over. And, and we realized, you know, we can't assume that the user knows how to keep a seed phrase safe or that the user is going to follow the best practices for uh, you know, putting their seed phrase like in a tamper evident bag in an access controlled location and having, you know, multiple redundant backups and yada, yada, yada. And so instead uh, we said, okay, user should throw away the seed and, and we will, we will instead keep the security model that is visualized within our application as the different devices in your multi-sig setup. And the nice thing about using these hardware devices is that you can do things like uh, have health checks. And so if, if you're not sure if your hardware device is still good, then you just go into the app and you click on health check and, and you plug in your hardware device and you sign a cryptographic message, which can then, you know, uh, validate that the device is working as intended. If anything goes wrong, if you lose a device, it stops working, whatever, we actually built in this key rotation mechanism into uh, the application. So you just go buy a new Trezor, Ledger, uh, what have you. You can buy it from us. You can buy it from the manufacturer. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and initialize it, plug it in, and we actually walk you through um, basically sweeping the funds off of the existing multi-sig and sending them to the new multi-sig setup with that new device uh, mm -hmm. uh, replacing the other one. And so 
we believe this is a much more flexible system. You're able to respond uh, to threats and losses a lot faster. Um, and it's just easier to uh, think about logically from a security perspective because you don't have uh, potentially plain text, you know, clear text uh, seed phrases floating around who knows where uh, throughout the world. We know that the private keys are all secured uh, within specialized hardware. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you my opinion or my feeling why that is actually a really good idea and advantage is because of, uh, you know, personal experience that, uh, you know, when you have a treasure, uh, you need to do regular updates or whatever in, uh, whenever it's needed. And I remember the last, one of the last updates, it was 1.8.3 on Trezor, Trezor 1, uh, the, the first model. Uh, it literally asked me to type in the, whatever the 12, uh, 24 monomic phrase into the keyboard and then into the browser. Now, and I already told Trezor that, or whatever the responsible decision makers, I told them uh, it would, would have been really advisable and wise to tell cu the, the customers that, or warn them that maybe it should, you know, maybe they should do the advanced mode. So they, so they whatever they click or they confirm the, uh, the 12 or 24 words on the device itself and not on the keyboard. And I think that's a really, dangerous risk people are going, you know, with whatever key loggers and uh, all these things. I mean, uh, uh, so would, would the, first of all, my question is, would the update still be done? Uh, you would still have, uh, the customer would still have to do the updates, right, on the, on the Trezor itself, right? So this is an interesting uh, question, actually. Um, though with regard to what you were saying, that's actually, it's particularly scary because there have been uh, a number of malicious Trezor wallet websites that have popped up that ask you to type in your seed phrase. Mm. So that, that's actually something that I've written a blog post about. I haven't published yet, but um, I'll be discussing a lot of issues with any browser-based operations with wallets because that just creates a huge attack surface. Um, but with regard to the actual firmware updates, it's kind of interesting. I've looked into this uh, myself. Um, not all firmware updates actually uh, wipe the device. Uh, it's, it seems like only the firmware updates that are patching like a vulnerability with an exploit where the seed could get extracted uh, end up doing that. Um, and so this is something that we actually stay on top of and we inform our customers if we believe it's something that they need to do. But most of the time, we actually find that it's not really necessary for our users to update their firmware because um, the old firmware continues to work fine. And in some cases, even when it is a security update, um, we find that it is actually not really changing the security model of our setup because our setup uses multiple geographically distributed uh, devices. So even if the, uh, an exploit was used against one of the devices that was you know, physically taken by an attacker, uh, that would not be sufficient for your wallet to be compromised. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a uh, James. I mean, I had a I had an email correspondence back and forth with Trezor, and they told me, yeah, you know, there's an option, advanced mode. And I said, well, it would have been nice if I had known about. I, you know, maybe, maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I didn't read the instructional manual of 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 you know dozens of pages first. But I'm you know always uh, you know speaking from the perspective of an average user. So if I had known that, I would have already activated the advanced mode, and I wouldn't have, you know, uh, in case of a firmware update type in the, the words to, into the keyboard and you know into the brow i mean that that's totally crazy but you know maybe they hadn't maybe that maybe they've improved i hope i hope i've done some constructive feedback and uh but from a security um, standpoint i think that's uh yeah pretty risky stuff i mean yeah just wanted no, to was that with the treasure one because at least yeah. with the model t you should be able to actually do more things on the screen yeah yeah, yeah, Trezor One. Yeah, that's 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 the issue because the Trezor, the Model T, sort of the the second version, the extended version, uh, is already by default, right? Only display on its device. So you know, I mean, we talk about security, privacy, and that's the whole point, you know, of having a hardware wallet. This is not a criticism. You know, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, as a feedback, maybe it could have been done by default. That's the only thing I'm saying. Why why isn't the advanced mode not by default? You know. 
but otherwise, you know, I'm really, you know, I'm one of the hugest fans of, of Trezor and now from now on Casa because <laughs> it's really, I'm, I'm total fan of, because this is really what is needed in this space, you know, user friendly, user experience, ease of use, intuitive, you know, handling uh, without needing to understand, I don't know, you know, how the internet works, email, you just, you know, go in, pop it up, you know, and you do your stuff, you know, so. I'm just hoping and wishing that this 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 could, you know this aspect could be more uh, uh, you know worked on. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the issues I think with uh, security. I mean, you're always making a trade-off mm. of usability versus security, and um, with a lot of the security-focused companies, I think that they 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 you know they focus on security sometimes to the detriment of usability and i think that's one of the unique things about casa is we're definitely focusing on security but um we also have a very high priority for usability and and you know the something we we have a lot of arguments about is you know what are the acceptable trade offs for us that we're willing to make uh to to make the usability uh basically at, at a higher level than you find with most of the other uh, software out there. Mm -hmm. um, all right, um, let me see if I have a couple of other questions. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't want to repeat questions which I've already discussed or elaborated on on, on, on those you know, excellent uh, interviews and, and podcasts. People should just check it out on, on lop.net slash interviews. It's really a treasure trove of information, knowledge, and, and wisdom, and really for, for the sake of comprehension. Um, so, all right, you talked about uh, challenges for the Lightning Network, engineering the liquidity in automatic fashion, um, user understanding channels, Bitcoin wallet only. Oh, this is this is really this is really an awesome uh, topic or subtopic. Bitcoin wallet only. You talked about the Bitcoin wallet only, uh, or Bitcoin wallet, which does everything by you know by default or automatically. Uh, what, what you're talking about, like interoperability, sort of, I'm just paraphrasing it, you know, vice versa, Bitcoin wallet, Lightning Network, Lightning Network, Bitcoin wallet, maybe even coin mixing, <laughs> everything by default, would that be the ultimate solution? Yeah, well, from the, like, when will Lightning Network go mainstream standpoint, I, I don't think that that will happen until we can abstract away a lot of these uh, low-level issues, like channel management and liquidity. And, um, and really, you have to ask yourself, does it even make sense that a user needs to know the difference between... Uh, funds that are in a lightning channel versus funds that are just on chain. Um, the user just wants to make a payment. I mean, they, they, they want to pay somebody. They don't really care how it happens. They just want it to happen and they don't want to have to like manually open channels and figure out liquidity issues and all this other stuff. So that is one of the long-term challenges with all of this is to figure out um, how do we take all of these issues that are currently being manually managed by advanced enthusiast users and write software that basically replicates whatever the actions that humans are doing right now so that in the future all of that stuff can be done by the software and all the user has to do is you know point and click and you know, scan a QR code and, and the pay payment just happens under the hood. Great. Um so um, I want to talk, uh, like we have got approximately 20 minutes. I want to have a little bit of your, you know, broader perspective, your bigger picture um, on um, the, you know, um, the, the, the situation that we have right now geopolitically, macroeconomically. Uh, we could have a recession by the end of next year, 2020, and that these are experts, you know, saying this. Uh, uh, we could have, uh, you know, the ultimate dream of the International Monetary Fund or whatever central banks to establish a cashless society. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think all these factors with inflation, hyperinflation, negative rate interest policy, maybe even negative bail-in on depositing accounts, this could accelerate the process, you know, of people flocking. It's like, you know, where I'm going to store my wealth, you know, how I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, circumvent the capital control or inflation, hyperinflation, bail-in. Yeah, there's a school of thought that um, Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have to evolve much 
all it has to do is not fail because it seems pretty much guaranteed that the existing system is going to fail in multiple ways. Um, how catastrophically is it going to fail? That's, you know, up for debate, but it's, it's, it's clear that a lot of people are going to be harmed and those are the people who are then going to be incentivized to look into alternative solutions. So um, uh, that is another reason why I think that it's important that we continue trying to, to scale the system, to make it more user friendly, you know, so that when those people find themselves in a situation where they're looking for alternatives, they, they don't find Bitcoin to be too onerous uh, to take advantage of. Um, James, what is, what is your vision? Uh, when, let's say once, uh, just, just for, the, for, the, you know, for, for the sake of imagination, what do you think uh, would happen once uh, you know, Bitcoin becomes so implemented and so, I don't know, ossified, implemented, uh, you know, monitor root layering is fully developed. Uh, this is one of my favorite questions because uh, it goes back, you know, to also Safed and Amu's book, uh, page 96 to 98, where it compares, you know, the 19th and 20th century. I also, uh, by the way, I, t I talked also very interestingly to Adam back about this in my, my interview with him. So I want to have your, your position, your, your perspective. What do you think could change? Like what, what would be the chain reaction on a social, scientific, technological, structural level? for our society, for our human civilization? Well, I mean, there's certainly plenty of utopian ideals of, of what may happen with all of that. Um, one of the, the biggest questions, I think, is what are the things that are currently being bought and paid for via inflation or via, you know, manipulation of the money supply. And if, if that manipulation is no longer possible, you know, what, what are the, the, the side effects of all of that? And so while, you know, some people talk about things like, Oh, tax taxation is going to become impossible and, and that's going to starve the nation state and whatever. Um, I don't necessarily believe that because as long as we are like physical beings that must reside within some sort of geographic boundary that is is controlled by a military backed nation state, they're probably going to be able to find you and uh, you know uh, extract some resources from you. So it, I think the the more logical question is uh, what happens when the uh, the starvation of uh, inflation uh, occurs and. And so that, you know, will probably have some major ripple effects through the, the banking system, the economy uh, will um, result in geopolitical changes because actually this, this happened um, during the, the Facebook or Libra hearings last week. There was a senator who he, he came right out and he said, you know, Mr. Zuckerberg, America prefers to uh, use the dollar as a, a tool uh, uh, to basically uh, pressure our enemies financially. Uh, we would much rather do that than, you know, send troops into an enemy country. And so, you know, that really struck me with how transparent they were about the weaponization of the dollar. Um, and of course, I, I think most people are familiar with the petrodollar and, and how that could have some major ripple effects if, if the dollar was no longer like the primary denomination for, for trading oil and, and potentially other large commodity markets. Um, but I'm not an economist. You know, I, don't, uh, I don't necessarily know how that's all going to play out. Uh, there are um, you know, folks who are hoping for hyper bitcoinization and that maybe like bitcoin ends up replacing the dollar as a unit of account for many things which would be of course great for for anyone in the bitcoin space but um before that happens i mean i think there is going to be a lot of turmoil and uh the unfortunate part of of all this is you know uh change often helps people, but it often hurts uh, people as well. You know, it hurts the incumbents who are currently benefiting from whatever the rules of the current system are. And um, what's very difficult to, 
predict is uh, how desperate those incumbents will become and what things they might do to try to, you know, grasp at retaining the last bits of the power that they see slipping away from them. So the, the only thing that I am fairly confident about is that, you know, the world is going to continue to get weirder and more complex and, uh, and potentially more chaotic. Mm. Very, yeah, very good point to make. Uh, you know, um, uh, Eric Vascoll, you know, uh, personally anyway, uh, he, you know, he writes this on Libit uh, coin, uh, his articles, and there was this discussion on Twitter, um, other means principle, it's called. And uh, I'm just going to, you know, quote a, a sentence out of it. I just want to know your thoughts about this. He says, uh, the, this conflict, you know, in, in connection with Bitcoin, this conflict between state and individuals for control of money will pass through up to four phases anticipated by the Bitcoin security model. These may overlap and vary regionally, but are each clearly identifiable. First, honeymoon. Second, black market. Third, competition. And fourth, surrender. So there's this process, obviously, that uh, that it sounds logical also to me, you know, because uh, it, it won't be like without uh, sort of a fight or a conflict or resistance. Uh, where do you see this going? I mean, it, do, do you see this this process, this evolution, like um, with in regards to states, nation states and seniorage, taxes? This is the whole point, I guess. We're paying taxes. So is, it this, is this going to change? Well... On the bright side, I think that a lot of the fears that uh, governments were going to clamp down and completely ban Bitcoin and you know kick down people's doors, um, that has mostly gone away. You know, sure there are a few countries that have uh, effectively banned it, but um, even you know just in the past few weeks, we we've seen uh, you know China start to talk about uh, blockchain technology initiatives. And, and completely reversing some of their uh, bans on various speech around this technology. And so I'm optimistic uh, that at least in a lot of the, the Western countries and uh, you know, potentially others as well, it, it seems like um, a lot of politicians are already invested in and benefiting from Bitcoin. And so from that perspective, it's already kind of infected the government, uh, hopefully to the extent that uh, a lot of these governments would not be willing to ban it because the politicians would actually be harming themselves. Uh, and so it's an, an interesting uh, juxtaposition of the, the benefits to the individuals who are uh, even part of the government versus the government as a whole, which is clearly not going to benefit uh, from having a competitive uh, monetary system. But it's just, that's what you have to look at, right? Is you have to look at the incentives and the game theory. And, uh, and it seems to be working out pretty well so far. Yeah, it seems they're doing us a really great favor. I always say, you know, this because <laughs> everything is sort of uh, a lot of things are, are are working out independently from one another, but it's still connected. So all these processes, you know, with China and uh, whatever federal chairman, uh, feder uh, the chairman of Federal Reserve or Donald Trump or the Treasury Secretary making statement now, the hearings in the Congress, and as you say, you know, th now they are. It, they, they've got skin in the game now, a lot of them, right? Decision makers, lawmakers, politicians, regulator, regulators. So uh, it's really a fascinating time we live in. So, um, uh, James, uh, first of all, I want to really appreciate your, your sharing knowledge. Uh, would you, would you, for the uh, last whatever ten minutes we have left, anything essential? Like somebody would come up to you, totally, you know. Uh, Non, not not knowledgeable about Bitcoin. What would be like the uh, the essential information you would you would give him or her to you know if this person is inspired or open minded? Where would you send him to? I mean, what, what, where should he start in the rabbit hole? Well, uh, I specifically have a getting started page on my website, which. Uh, is you know a bunch of non-technical explanations. Um, I think we've even got some like uh, you know cartoons and 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 animated stuff uh, there that um, it kind of 
explains uh, the system at a really high level as you know uh, a way of of proving ownership of, of assets and uh, transferring assets, you know, without a third party. <clears throat> yeah, it was the the getting started uh, link. You were right there um, oh, on cool. Bitcoin resources. Yeah, getting started is right there on the left. Uh, gotcha. And and so, uh, yeah, first steps, you know, basic facts, frequently asked questions, but then like the, you know, explain Bitcoin like I'm five will uh, <clears throat> be able to be understood by most people. And then, you know, I have plenty of other more in-depth uh, technical uh, explanations if people really care. But I, I also say that the, the Bitcoin white paper is actually a pretty easy read. Um, most people probably hear white paper and they think, oh, this is going to be really technical and above my head. But Satoshi wrote the white paper in fairly plain terms. Um, there's not a whole lot of technical jargon in there. And, and even if it is too much, uh, I've got like some annotated versions of the white paper that, that go into even more detail of explaining, you know, exactly what uh, any of the, the technical uh, explanations are. And so, you know, you don't you don't necessarily even have to understand what any of those uh, like algorithms or functions are in there. Right. Uh, I think the the diagrams explain a lot. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but can I ask you something, Jameson? Can I? Yeah. You, the first time you you read because I heard I hear this from a lot of people you know who are real and even Andreas Antonopoulos like uh, reading it the first time people just brush it away. Was that in your case too, or did you like did it make click in your head? In your brain. No, um, I, I definitely dismissed Bitcoin the first few times that I just heard about it in the news. But then, you know, the third or fourth or fifth time or whatever that it kept coming up, I, I decided, okay, it's not dying. I should probably look into it. And so that is when I actually read the white paper. And when I read the white paper, I was pretty amazed. I was, I was like, this is actually an amazing solution to a computer science problem that I had never even really thought about. And so that intrigued me because I, I have a computer science degree. And so it got me interested from a technical standpoint. Uh, but of course I was also simultaneously interested just from a philosophical uh, sort of uh, libertarian standpoint as well. And um, the, the, the white paper does not, explain actually quite a few things uh, there there are a ton of things that are missing from the white paper but it does a great job of explaining just the high level concepts of how do you build a system that is not reliant upon trusted third parties to come to consensus gotcha yeah yeah i, I just found the annotated version of yours uh really great yeah, it's wow, what a treasure trove of information. This is great. This is great stuff. Yeah, people need to, I mean, you know, take upon their self responsibility and educate themselves. I mean, all we can do is really give them the inspirations, the knowledge is really there. It's open source, it's it's freely available and there's tons of really excellent material with a podcast, videos, interviews articles written on medium.com um, um, it's it just it's just endless yeah but but here's the thing about all of the the education and resources um, the reason why people should be doing that and educating themselves is because it is such a new system it's mm -hmm. it's still risky it's still complicated um, if we get to the point where this is a mainstream adopted thing, then people won't need to educate themselves about much of it at all, except maybe that they need to, you know, have a backup of their seed phrase or something. Um, other than that, you know, um, it's just like the internet. Like you said, you don't know how the internet works or email works. It's because um, the people who were using it, you know, 20, 30 years ago, they had to educate themselves about how it was working at a low level because not many layers of abstraction had been built on top of it to make it user friendly. You had to know how to get on the command line and you know dial your modem into like a specific uh, uh, telephony based ISP 
and, and, and you know, potentially even configure the like uh, frequency and baud of your modem and all this other stuff. Uh, but, but now, you know, people just go buy a mobile phone and start tapping around on it and they can accomplish amazing things. And I, I fully expect the, the same thing is going to happen with Bitcoin, Lightning, and any other technologies that are built on top of it, is that we get to the point where it's so easy to use. You know, you can, you can basically hand a, a phone or a tablet to a toddler and they can start uh, uh, working their way through and, and making payments without asking anybody for permission. <laughs> Great. So, Jameson, um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I really appreciate your your um, your commitment. You know your ethos. Uh, you know your, all your work is you in the background. If you had like a like a one title that you would give this interview, what would it be? <laughs> what have we talked about? In essence, is it about freedom? Is it about adoption? Is it about evolution? What is it about? Is it about you know? What is it? Well, I mean, I think that we've mostly covered just the the complexity of this space. Um, mm -hmm. It uh, it is, and it continues to be a, a system that is so complicated and has so many different facets to it that um, you you can choose one of them and and dig in as deep as you want to, or you can you know try to go broad and 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 cover a lot at a high level, but you know the the ultimate issue with i think education and and trying to learn more about stuff in this space is that uh everyone should just follow their own path um i i i often get questions from people of like you know i want to contribute to this space you know what do i need to learn or or you know what should i contribute to this space and and ultimately, the, because there is no authority, there is no project manager, um, there, there's no real way to, to specifically point people to a specific path to say, you know, this is the path that you have to take. I think that everyone has to take their own path um, and explore whatever pieces of the system they find most interesting. And... Uh, you know, if, if you're non-technical, then you're probably not going to go down the technical side, but maybe you're more interested in the economics or, or the, the finance or um, aspects of like governance and consensus. Um, um, Bitcoin needs to have as many, you know, experts in different areas as possible because this is an organic, open community movement. Um, so, uh, as long as people are educating themselves about something, then that will give you the ability to contribute back uh, with whatever discussions arise in the future about uh, what we need to do to make this system better. Beautiful said. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Jameson, thank you so much uh, for you know, sharing your time, your knowledge and your wisdom and uh, hope to see you soon, maybe on some other event conference or maybe on a panel discussion. <laughs> and yeah, appreciate everything you do and hope to yeah, talk to you soon again. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Welcome to the podcast show by Key Bandavani, The Total Connector, Total Bitcoin, Awesome Economics, The Hardest and Scarcest Money Ever Created in Human History, Bitcoin. <laughs>